Hi, welcome to the Honeycomb Podcast, the podcast all about New Zealand food and drink and the people that make it happen. I'm Asha Boot, your host and owner of The Ramen Shop, Hillside Kitchen and Cellar in Tenekori Bistro. Taking care of all the technical stuff is producer Steve Cochran of Rockpool Productions. This week, Nalini and Colin from Lotte Olive Oils in Martinborough join us to chat about olive oils and the wider New Zealand hospitality scene. So, Lotte, what is it? Wow, you're sitting at Lotte. <laughs> this is lot number eight at um, Martin Roller Group. So uh, in that regard, I guess it's very unimaginative. But it's a name that's worked for us. I've been asked whether it's because eight is significant to Asians, mm. whether we chose eight for that reason. Um, no. 2002, the trees were loaded with olives, and we knew we had to pick them and press them. And we thought, well, what do, how do, what do we name ourselves? You know, <laughs> there, there, was, there was no marketing plan, you know, it all happened so quickly. And we thought uh, we could put our names together and come up with a really unique name, you know, like Zespri. Nobody would be able to, to copyright that. And so we played with Collini and a few other variations and it all sounded European yeah. or Italian particularly. And we thought, no, we, we want to stay really New Zealand. Mm. And under huge pressure to get a name to the artist so that our, our logo could be <laughs> created, we came up with Lot 8. And here we are, yeah. 16 Coming to 17 years later, we're still lot eight. Okay. Yeah. So 2002 was the first harvest. Yes. How long have you been here? We, we bought the grove in 1997, the end of 1997, and the trees had just been planted. So one year, in the, well, what we call one year old tree. Yep. Mm. First year in the ground. So five years to yeah. maturity. Yeah. Which is, you know, quite a revelation because all of our research that we'd done, you know, having come through Europe, having looked at olive groves and their planting and the harvesting, they uh, indicated, well, no, you you can at least have 10 years' time uh, to prepare yourselves for what, what will become your business, hopefully, one day. <laughs> and we were far, harvesting our first commercial harvest within five years. Uh, was that due so, to environment or varietal? We don't know. We just think New Zealand is really suited to olives. New Zealand environment, uh, based on what others were doing at the time, was clear that Olives came to maturity sooner in New Zealand mm. than they okay. did overseas. Mm. But as to how much sooner, nobody, even today, I don't think anyone's quite certain on that. Yeah. 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 So before pre-olive, uh, where did you come from? What, what drew you to growing olives and, and Martin Brad? But what was your sort of previous careers? What were you doing? We were living in Wellington and Nali was in chambers as a, as a barrister. I was doing human resources things, I think it was at the National Bank at that stage, and we were looking for something that we would just sort of relax with. We mm. didn't have a family to worry about, so we were thinking, where do we divert our attention? We'd heard, I had as, at an earlier age, heard about olives being planted in Marlborough. And there was a successful group that we, yeah, what, we, we, we kept. We were entertained by, by Selene Estate and shown what they were just planting, and that was pretty okay. exciting. We were ready to go. We found some land. We weren't sure of the price. Got on the ferry to come home, hit seven metre waves somewhere in Cook Strait and realised And that I'm not a sailor. <laughs> yeah. well, As a matter of fact, I do not have sea legs at all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am a sailor or have sailed a lot and I turned green on that ferry. It's the first time I ever turned green. So that was a good reason not to um, make it a weekly trip yeah. to Marlborough. Okay. Yep. So we parked the idea about a, what was it, a season later, yeah. we were, came over the hill to Wairapa for a weekend and saw these olive groves for sale and thought, hmm, that's a nice idea. And it's kind of, that's where we came to. Yeah. So it was two professionals, both though with roots in, in different areas of, of agriculture. I'd grown up in the beef and venison world. I'd also, let, my, my father was very involved in salmon farming um, at one stage after I'd left home. Nalini had come from the agriculture, you know, in her, in her family that's Fiji, the my or father's the side of the family of farmers. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we had a we had a love of of and wanted to be involved in some way in the primary primary yeah. production in New Zealand. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. I do like the idea of, of people going farming for a relaxed time. Yes. We <laughs> we, uh, we sort of had hoped that when it came to retirement, we wanted a property that had grown trees. Yeah. That, that we were actually arriving or had already arrived somewhere. We'd, one, it felt familiar, and two, it was already, you know, to be enjoyed. And yep. that's exactly what we managed to create here. Yeah, so fantastic. we're quite happy. We just have to wait for retirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we hope there's a retirement. 
the the two of you that I know, uh, for lack of a better word, are foodies. Like you're real foodies, such supporters of of the food industry and restaurants, and 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 you really do champion restaurants, which is amazing. Was that has that always been a part of your life? Food has that been a big part of who who you are? Food has always been part of my life, and Lotte. To, when when I think about Lotte, I don't think of it as there's Nalini and then when she steps out of being Nalini, there's Lotte. Lotte is Nalini as much as Nalini is Lotte. Yeah. So you mentioned that the chefs in our, our support of the restaurant business. All of the chefs that we work with, they're part of my family. Mm. I do not see them as business relationships. They are not. I mean, it is a very yeah. business relationship, as you know. But to me, they're, they're people who I just love. I love them like I, they're part of yeah. my family. So it's an extension to myself and extension to Lotte. So, and that's why we're so much part of that industry. But we do love food. We love food. We love <laughs> all sorts of food. We love food. We like trying out different, different parts of New Zealand to see what, what's trending. But our, our interest doesn't stop at making olive oil. Our interest goes as far as to understand what goes on in the kitchens of our mm. chefs and what they do, how they use it, how the product is used. That's what we bring back to the Grove, and that is what trains me to create something new the following year and the following year and the following Chefs are very giving of themselves, particularly chefs who are very passionate about what mm. they do. When you walk into a restaurant and you say, I really like this, and that will tell you where the product has come from and why they're made or their grandmother's recipe, they're modified so we can enjoy all of that. The, I, I really, truly want that to transfer to the retail side of, side yeah. of our business. Yeah. I'd like equally as passionate retailers that we work with. And I know you've got limitations around what, what, um, what we're allowed uh, health to and do. safety yeah. will allow you to do. But I mean, what, what is the benefit of saying, I went to Europe and had a really good time when we you know what people are saying is, Every deli I walked into, they gave me something to taste. In New Zealand, if you didn't wear gloves, if you didn't have the right temperature yeah. of food, you know, you just can't do that. And it's ridiculous. It we is. make, you only have to travel to find out how good the food is here. That's and, very true. Yeah. Very and true. we need to make sure every Kiwi knows that. And the way you do that is that, that benta over the counter. Absolutely. And being able to get, say, oh, well, actually, would you like to taste this before you buy it? So the thing about food is that unless you've tasted it, you can't really talk about mm. it. You can't. You cannot have an informed opinion unless you have personally tasted something. Yeah. And, yeah, we don't all have the same palate. Some some people have very sharp palate. But most of us know food, understand food, have eaten it their entire lives to be able to say what their likes and dislikes are. So... Somebody went to Kaikoura and had their crayfish in by the beach, you know, next thing they know, they've got friends stopping over on the way to the South Island. What do you think they'll be saying? Absolutely. When you get off the Picton yep. Ferry, right? Go here. That is how you promote food. Yeah, well, you uh, cannot beat that. Nalini posts a lot on Facebook and a, a lot of food on Facebook. In fact, I get told what to have for dinner by people on the train. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fantastic. And I hear their comments, good yeah. and bad. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's more important... The idea is to inspire. Yeah, but yeah. And a lot of that stuff looks like it's fine dining, but it's not always. And, and, and some of the things we've enjoyed and still talk about are things like sitting at the top of Bluff Hill, eating, going to the only fish and chip shop in Bluff, or at least on the day we were there, um, and eating Beautiful. battered blue cod, oh. freshest chips mm. I've ever had, yes. and the wind blowing, you know, like and it was going to take us out, and seagulls all around. <laughs> and it was yeah. just the most beautiful, beautiful yeah. We did it. We lunch. did it on Tuesday night. We, we went to sea and bought Tuesday, fish and yeah. chips and yeah. sat by the beach, and I just needed to be by the sea, and it yeah. was blowing a gale. Seagulls were trying to steal our food again, but it was just wonderful. It's all part of it. Quintessentially Wellington. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah, talking about your, your foodie side and interaction with restaurants, you within your olive oils, you do your range of flavoured oils. Yeah. That process that you use, you know, it's not an infusion, really. Yes. It's, it's actually part of the oil-making process. Yeah. Uh, can, can you maybe give us an example of what one of those oils are and, and what that process is? Lotte started with two extra virgin olive oils. Yeah. That, that's how we started um, 16 years ago. 10, almost now 11 years ago, Sean from Logan Brown asked, you know, if there was an oil that he could use in his ice creams that tasted real. So I went away and, and, and came up with the citrus oil and that was born. And then from there, I, I sort of got more and more confident and decided to make more what we call fragrant oils. They're all curl pressed. 
So we put them through the press with the olives. Yeah. The whole thing, thinking behind that is that there has to be such an assimilation that happens that when the oil finally comes out of the machine, you should be able to seamlessly taste that oil yeah. as a fully combined oil. Why I went down that path, in absolute honesty, there's no way other way I know how to prepare food. Yeah. So I grew up in Fiji, farming family on my dad's side of the family and professionals on my mum's side of the family, but all foodies. And so from my earliest recollection of food, it was all about preparing it yourself. Mm. doing it yourself and preparing it for yourself. And when it came to olive oil, I had the opportunity to taste a European orange oil. And I just, it truly, truly clashed with my palate. Okay. All I could taste was a, a, an immediate familiar taste of orange, followed by a lot of Teflon, mm. followed by something that did taste a little like olive oil, but could actually have been a blended oil. Yeah. And that instilled enough sort of faith in me to go looking for another way of making that citrus oil I was going to make for Sean. So that when Sean tasted it, I mean, Sean's one of the people I think of as having one of the sharpest palates yeah, in this country. Absolutely. I didn't want Sean to think, well, you know, I had such so much faith in you, Nalini, and this, this is, you know. So a lot of citrus died in the process of that that first but <laughs> yep. we, we achieved it yep. and that gave me faith from there on to be able to use raw ingredients to make and i i will never ever do anything but make cold pressed fragrant oils yeah and we're so lucky we have such good products to work with in this country and, and it's the you, local products are what you're using as much as possible as much as possible well, i will never step out of new zealand unless i absolutely have yeah. to step out of new zealand Making cold pressed fragrant oils is not as easy as it might sound like because mm. there's so many things at play. You don't know how the ingredient that tastes quite natural when you bite into a lemon or you bite into a yuzu is going to taste like when you throw in the, those things called olives. Yeah. When you put it, when you put it through a hammer mill, when there's malaxing happening, when there's a separator that separates, it really takes a good understanding of the raw ingredient to at least be able to imagine what the resultant oil is going to be like. Yeah. And then if you do not get it, you just go back and you try again and you try again. The other thing that I think overlays that too is when you look at our... So as Nani said, we've got eight oils. Two of them are extra virgin, but the other six are cold-pressed flavoured oils. Yeah. And they're not single flavours. No, so one of the things we learned along the way is that it's not just a case of taking a, a lemon and squeezing it no. with some olives. Mm. In fact, until we produced the yuzu, we did nothing with a single ingredient. Okay. Yuzu was the one thing that lent itself because to Because it's so to complex yes. and yeah. it's so fragrant that we could do that with the yuzu. So uh, we've spoken about the, the yuzu, the citrus, um, the herbs de oh, Provence. Um, my favourite is the aromatic. Yes. With the vanilla coming through yes. it, I think it's fantastic. What, what else is in the range and what's the new one? What, what, what can we expect? Right, so we've just launched a brand new product, which Lotte has been making since 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a market-led product. It's a product that the chefs asked us to make in 2012. So we made our first New Zealand cooking oil. And 2019 is the first time we're taking to the retail market. Fantastic. Uh, it's the extra virgin and vegetable blend oil, which okay. you can cook with Yeah. Um, at high temperatures as well. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about that. It's something I've always talked about, um, heating olive oil and the effect that it has on it at certain temperatures. Yeah. You obviously cook with olive oil a lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah, what do you recommend? I mean, obviously you have a new product on the shelves. It's, it's the perfect recommendation. <laughs> but... It, what, you know, using olive oil in cooking, at what point should you not use olive oil and start looking at a cooking oil? Okay, so I'm not a scientist, neither am I a nutritionist. So I, I can't talk to you as, an, as a scientist. All I can talk to you about is my observations over mm -hmm. the last 16 years of being part of this industry. And having the good fortune to be in Australia a few times now where I was with food scientists who showed us the results of um, heating extra virgin olive oil. I can tell you that you can take extra virgin olive oil as high as 205 degrees wow. before it reaches smoke point. Why you would do to that to mm. a, a really well-made oil, I don't really know because there are other oils that you could you could, which is slightly cheaper, which is you know yeah. mass produced that you can do that with. that still tastes good, and your food will taste good yep. as well. Um, food 
really can be front. The temperature, the highest temperature that you should take your oil to in order to get your brown browning happening, your caramelization, or your frying. Yeah. Between 140 and 160, you yep. should be able to do that. And olive oil works, extra virgin even, works very well within that, that range. Um, I do a lot of Asian frying, a lot of Asian stir fries and things like that. And the oil that I made for the chefs, I made it not just for the smoke, smoke point. That's just, that's just for the, on the peripheries of why I made yeah. the oil. It was to be able to make a clean oil, yeah. an oil that when you cooked with didn't compete with your food. And that is exactly what we achieved. And when you look at the kitchens that they go to, you know, from Baduzi to Siddharth to um, sure. Euro Sugar Club, you know, really waiting for Wellington to catch up. But Auckland is our number one market when it comes to to food, to yeah. our cooking oil. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, those guys are all doing really well because they've yeah. got lot of cooking oil in their kitchen. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, but the one thing about the, the heating, the heating debate, heating of your olive oil debate, extra virgin olive oil is a real labor of love. Yeah. We, if we're really lucky in New Zealand, we can get yields as high as 18%. In a particularly good year, it could go as much as 24 mm. We generally average about 12 to 15%. So there's a lot of hard work and a lot of, you know, olives to make that little bit of golden drop on yeah. your spoon. Why heat it to temperatures yeah. where the nutrition drops out of it? And the taste drops out of it. But yeah, the flavor definitely raw, drops as out. Much as, yeah. as, as the thing for me. Yeah, as it much really as possible, eat it raw. Yeah. Eat it. Or as you, no, if not as you're finishing oil. I mean, the two oils that I make, the Harissa and the Herbs of Provence, they're actually designed to go into your food. Yeah. So when you're cooking your mushroom, partway through cooking the mushroom, you yeah. add the Herb of Provence. When you're making your lamb meatballs, add the, the Harissa. To the meatballs, to, to the mince, and then Absolutely. yeah, yeah. The vanilla in the in the aromatic is, I think, what you like, and it's because yeah. it's natural vanilla. And yeah. we have uh, Tahitian vanilla. Yep. And we just thanks to the prime minister's visit to New A with um, the lovely Rex from Bulgot Street Bistro, yeah. we've just acquired some uh, New oh, vanilla. Awesome. So good. we're probably, I am very interested in exploring yeah, that yeah. further. To be able to do a pressing with a new aim. Okay, so I guess uh, still talking about the industry in general, but a, a topic that, that we've been bringing up a lot, and it's it's a major issue in the hospitality industry, is is women in our industry, especially in kitchens. Um, it's something that we've actively tried to to help with. I guess um, through our restaurants, we always try to have senior female staff in kitchens. You've worked with Nawai at Hillside mm, in the past. And yes, it's, it's yeah things we've actively tried to do. Women in business, I mean, from yourself, you're someone that's that's doing well and successful and, and all those sort of things. What's your just general perspective, I guess, of, of being a woman in business? I know you've won awards mm. along those lines. Yes, yeah. Can you just give us, whether it's an encouragement or thoughts in general in, in I, being a woman in business? When it comes to gender, the issue of gender, I'm a realist. I won't support my gender just because I'm a woman myself. But if our industry is suffering an imbalance and if men have had played a role in creating that imbalance, then shame on them. Mm. Um, if you have not, not you, not you as you <laughs> yourself, but if men have not given women the same opportunities, um, then really they yeah. need to take a hard look at themselves and say, why is it that we have not? Yes, I understand, you know, women take time out to have families and women... Um, for whatever reason, decide maybe this um, our, between our marriage we don't need to have a full full mm. earning, uh, full time earning spouse, um, and have decided to take time off for whatever reason. That's fine. They took time off, and therefore they cannot expect to lead to reach the levels that a male has who's worked. You know, he said, um, men have generally been the the breadwinners, I guess, in the past, and that's probably another reason why mm. that we had more males than females in the kitchen. But now we've got to a stage I think that shouldn't even be a conversation. Yeah. I think it's just a natural thing. If a woman is talented, if a woman can do the hours, if a woman can cook as well as a man, then why is she not at the head of the kitchen or yeah. why is she not the sous, sous chef? There should be no reason whatsoever for that. I'm, I'm very lucky. I, were, I was brought up by parents 
who did not believe in any form of discrimination of any form of holding people back because of their race, class, gender, all of those. So um, this sort of things have had to be actually talked to me about for yeah. me to realise that actually, you know what, it is a problem in New Zealand. We have got a problem. We do treat our women differently. And for a country that gave us votes, this <laughs> is a really embarrassing uh, indictment. Yeah. So going forward, I think... Let's just stop. If somebody comes through your kitchen, just as if a prisoner is released from a prison and is really interested to help you in your kitchen because nobody else will give them a job, please do them a favor. You could absolutely change their life for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So there's no excuses. I will not take any excuse in that regard. And there's some, some men, I think, who've led that very well, uh, would like to see more and more women as part of our industry. I'd like them to have greater voice and I'd like them to champion the whole industry. Mm. But as a business person, I don't see myself as a woman in business. Yeah. I got I was recognized for it and I'm extremely honored to be recognized. But when I step out of that that house into this this part of the lotte business, I don't see myself as a woman going to work. I just see as somebody who's very passionate about what she's doing and therefore doing it. And so if women want to be recognized, they've got to get that mindset as well. Mm. Okay, get yourself out there, knock on the doors, do not be embarrassed. At my age, I can say you'd rather embarrass yourself asking than to one day look back and say, I was so scared of being embarrassed, I didn't do it. Yeah. So be proactive. Fantastic. Yeah. Very good. All right, so important things, let's, let's help you sell some oil. Uh, where, where, where can everyone uh, outside the industry, we know how to contact you. Yes. Uh, in the industry. People wanting to buy your oil um, in stores and shops, where are the best places to, to look for that? We always start with saying buy online. Yeah. Anywhere, pretty much anywhere in New Zealand, we can get it to you overnight or uh, at the most two, two days delivery time. Uh, Wellington, we're very lucky. Mo Wilson have supported us for, for pretty much from the very okay. start of Lot 8 and we're hugely grateful to Julie and her team for that. Stephen, Entrez, um, they're very good. Um, um, Big supporter. It's a very mm. good, very one of our long-standing supporters. Auckland, we have uh, New World Remuera and we have Victoria Park. Um, but apart from that, and Replete in Replete in um, Taupo, Valentine's in Christchurch. And New World Thorndon. New World Thorndon. Yep. Oh, I forgot about that. French Baker and Greytown. French Baker and Greytown. Um, if ever in doubt, just anybody. send us an email and we'll always tell people yeah. how they can get get hold of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, look, thank you so much for, for chatting us to us today. I, I would like to kind of close out, I guess in a way, giving both of you an opportunity to to give a message to um, the industry or the consumer. What you know, what some some guidance to to them or your thoughts of what we can do better as an, an industry. And I'm talking about restaurants. Um, especially, but also um, people looking at products on the shelves of their, their local store or restaurant. Um, what sort of, from a grower's perspective, what's the thought process that those people should have? I guess for, for me, and this is me, not Lot 8, but I think it's really important, and you see it more overseas, in the United States and in Europe, different things, but the same. People really ask what their products are. People want to, that, that people t go and seek out to taste things. When they find something good, it's what Nalini was saying before, I suppose they champion it. Um, and I think that it not only applies to the, to the industry and chefs and kitchens and, and sommeliers if it's wine, um, it's all about understanding that we have great stuff here, but that we also have great stuff from other places. But enjoy what you enjoy find it and, and, and consume it and champion it and talk about it. Olive oil suffers particularly from the fact that it is an industry in New Zealand which is young, new and up against tradition, which isn't necessarily aligned to the quality of what people consume. So ask the retailer, where does this product come from? When was it, you know, what, what was its age? Is it truly extra virgin? Those sort of questions are, are worth asking. But the other thing is try the New Zealand mm. product and if you like it, enjoy it mm. and understand that you might pay a little bit more but you're getting a, a, a very high quality product we, we're lot eight so of course we think you should buy lot eight olive oil i won't walk away from that but new zealand olive oils are, are, are right up there yeah. um so don't, mm. don't and i, and I think, think the, otherwise the key there is and this is the same if you've got a restaurant that you like keep going back mm. 
Mm. If you've got olive oil you like, keep buying it because mm. you're going to continue to support the growth mm. of that That's right. of yeah. that particular thing that you like yeah. and, and spread it that way. I don't know whether it's age or whether I've been in this industry so long now that it's it's become my life. But the fact that we have got mental health issues mm. does concern me a lot. It's, in the it's, industry. Um, yeah, Absolutely. in the industry. I know from from being part of Lot 8 for the last 23 years, it is a lonely business. You, I mean, you look at my environment. When Colin is um, at work in the city, in the do- days when um, Colin had a de- full-time job and I ran Lot 8 pretty much on, day in, day out, I'd be here on my own. Mm. So it is a lonely business. And it can get it get it can get quite quite stressful, and sometimes you can go days without talking to anyone. Mm. Now, one of the presumptions I've made before, and I've mentioned this to you before we started recording, is that we assume as suppliers that all chefs know each other, that you understand each other, you know each other, you get together on a regular basis, that you have a relationship. The industry has a relationship, when actually our industry is like capsules of businesses you may form a larger capsule you may fill a bottle but inside the bottle you are thematically sealed capsules on in your own right you don't actually get to assimilate so that causes its own i think problems and that is probably why it's highly stressful i Mm. know that kitchens are hot places (laughs) you know you get five people who five tables who booked in to to dine Three may not turn up, then you've got those traces. You might get five extra tables arrive at short notice, which is fantastic. They've just filled your ta- your restaurant. But guess what? 15 of them don't eat everything that's on your menu. And there in your kitchen, you are juggling things to be able to meet each and every one of those persons' expectations and requirements. Because the minute they walk out of your restaurant, there's a thing called social media. And as hard as you may have worked in your kitchen to provide what you think they want, if the expectation did not meet you know, what arrived on the plate, suddenly you're a guy who can't cook. Yeah. Right? So the pressure on the people in the kitchen, I am very familiar with after Mm. 17 years of being part of of the the making of the olive oil business. And I can understand where the mental issues can come from. I really, really would like us to work on that. Yeah. That does does keep me awake. I'll be very honest with you. That's a huge thing. And and look, I've I've battled with uh, my own demons there and and have started speaking about that. And the the second thing, just from closing, the second other thing that constantly occupies my thinking is how do we turn our industry into a real industry? Mm. If you go to Venice today and you walk into Harry's Bar, you'll see people behind the counter that have been there for 60 years. Absolutely. It is a profession. Yeah. They love it. They join the profession knowing they joined a profession. They are professionals in the food industry. I'd love New Zealand to have that. Yeah. To walk into a restaurant and see the same waiter five years later, honestly, just oh. brings the greatest joy in my <laughs> life. It's like something they're doing here is right or The people who are here know they're in the right environment. So it's time we became a real industry. It's time to stop talking about our offshore experiences and how wonderful they were because we went to Europe, grandma's still cooking. I'd like grandma to be in the kitchen here as well. I'd like all of us to join the industry knowing we're we're professionals. You know, you don't have to be a lawyer accountant. I've done the lawyer thing. I, I am a lawyer. I understand all of that. But the man who cooks or the woman who cooks my chicken before it's served to me and the person who brings it to my table and the person who dropped my wine, all of those are professionals to me. Absolutely. They have to have knowledge of the industry, knowledge of the food, knowledge of what happened in the kitchen, knowledge of being able to say to me, what I'm about to present to you is the best that comes out of this kitchen. We have a whole industry that grows beautiful things. And unfortunately, at the farm gate their life stops to interact with people like you yeah. or, or the, the green grocer that's going to sell it. We have to talk like a fully integrated industry to be able to proudly say, this tomato on your plate was hanging on a vine. I'm pointing at the tomato I've just served you. <laughs> yeah. Was hanging on a vine two hours before you arrived yeah. here. And I'm very happy to have grown it organic. Yeah. You know, that's an industry. That's, that's who I'd like us to become. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It's so, so, so appreciated. I know. Thank I'm you pretty for coming. Full on, but thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you to both of you. <laughs> thank you. 
Thanks for taking the time to listen to us today. Check out honeycomb.co.nz for information and links relating to this episode. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you'll never miss an episode. 